The next item of business is portfolio questions. I will try to get as many people in as possible in each part of the 40 minutes, the 20 minutes of session, so people could be aware um, of quite succinct questions and answers so that all their colleagues can get an opportunity here. Question number one on rural economy and connectivity is Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what support it gives for skills development in the rural economy. Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government supports skills development in rural areas through developing Scotland's Young Workforce Programme through modern apprenticeships, schools, colleges and universities. This activity provides opportunities for people living in rural Scotland to develop their skills and gain qualifications, including in traditional rural industries like farming, forestry and land use. We committed in the Programme for Government to developing a Rural Skills Action Plan and will publish this in due course. Alex Rowley. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I recently had the pleasure of meeting young people who had completed a shared forestry apprenticeship scheme delivered by Rural Skills Scotland, a not-for-profit sharing organisation based in Loch Gelly. The land-based sector needs an injection of new and young talent to keep up with the growing demand for skills. However, the sector comprises mainly of small and micro businesses, and many of them find it difficult to employ apprentices through the existing model. Would the Minister join me in congratulating Rural Skills Scotland for this piece of innovative work, and will he take the time to look at this successful project in order to provide sustainable mechanisms for the future delivery of apprentices in this sector. Fergus Ewing. Yes, I think Mr Rowley makes a very fair point. Uh, I'm pleased that he's raised this scheme. It's a, a good scheme. He uh, did anticipate he would raise it and looked into it. And through Forestry Commission Scotland, the Scottish Government provided £107,000 over the last two years towards the shared apprenticeship scheme. And six apprentices were employed uh, by Rural Skills Scotland and placed with forestry enterprises, uh, mostly in the public or third sector, uh, and also forest enterprise have subsequently uh, provided um, eight uh, young people with apprenticeships in the south of Scotland. And I understand there was over a couple of hundred applications for that, namely quite a few who were unsuccessful. So I certainly undertake, Mr Rowley, that I will look into these matters further. Uh, good progress has been made, but more can be done. Short supplementary, please, Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I declare an interest uh, as a partner in the farming business, Jay Halker Johnson and Sons? Um, I recently attended the National Sheep Association event and spoke with a, a young person there who's looking at uh, entering sheep farming as a profession, facing a number of barriers to that. Um, these new entrants are vital uh, to the sustainability of Scotland's rural economy. So, can I ask the, the Minister what update he can give to the Scottish Government's commitments to improve opportunities for new entrants and particularly what coordination there is with skills providers and rural businesses and communities? to ensure that we are building rural skills in a way that meets the needs of these areas. Fergus Ewing. Uh, since uh, 2015, grant schemes under the Scottish Rural Development Programme have, presiding officer, helped to kick-start more than 250 new agricultural businesses with around £13 million of support, mainly to young farmers. Uh, in addition to that, we have set up a farming opportunities for new entrants, the acronym which uh, I... Uh, devised is called FONE, F-O-N-E, a catchy acronym, uh, which, uh, uh, which seeks to maximise land opportunities for those seeking access to the first rung of the farming ladder by making available land from the public sector owned by local authorities, by SEHIE, Scottish Water Forestry Commission, uh, and already, thanks to the good work of Henry Graham and others, We've created more than 50 new land opportunities through that initiative. And thirdly, we put in place a dedicated new entrance to farming program under our farm advisory services, providing a network of support with advice and skills. But there is more that we need to do. I acknowledge that. Uh, and Mr. Johnson's question is quite apposite. I'm very happy to work with him as we develop our plans further. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what investment it has committed to transport infrastructure in the central Scotland region. Hamza Youssef. Continue to invest uh, heavily in our transport infrastructure in central uh, Scotland. Recent and ongoing uh, commitments would include, for example, the 500 million that's spent on the M M7374 motorway improvement project, the uh, Egypt rail project, sh Shots electrification, the refurbishment of Concarden Bridge, continued investment 
in the canal network uh, and the continued investment in an active travel infrastructure through our Community Links and Community Links Plus programme. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Tweka Bridge over the Forth and Clyde, and Can Clyde Canal is now out of commission, which means my constituents who live in Knock and Starry Marina can no longer travel west. Uh, the Tweka Bridge might not be as grand as the Falkirk Wheel, but it serves exactly the same purpose of opening the canal network to travel. I think if the Falkirk Wheel broke down, we'd expect to see immediate action. When can my constituents expect to see um, the Tweka Bridge being repaired and the Central Scotland Canal Network, which successive governments have committed millions of pounds to, uh, to reopen on a permanent basis? Hamza, you said. I can thank Mark uh, Griffin for his question. It is an important issue that he is uh, raising. Uh, of course, just a couple of points uh, to make. One is uh, perhaps the obvious one, but worth reiterating that the, the reason for the closure, of course, is based on safety. Safety has to be absolutely paramount. So when there are uh, either uh, issues with the assets or indeed failures of the assets, we can't risk anybody's uh, lives at all. So therefore, this, in, this action has been taken because of safety and safety being paramount. Uh, in terms of the government, we, of course, increased the budget uh, for Scottish canals uh, in, in, in the most recent budget. Uh, there are, at the moment, restricted hours of operation uh, at the moment uh, for uh, the, the, the Bonnie Bridge and Tweker uh, bridges. Uh, the last time it was opened, uh, I should say only around half a dozen people uh, took advantage of that. But to give the members some reassurances, Scottish canals are continuing work at the moment to identify any potential solutions to, re to restore full operation uh, of the bridges that he mentions. I'll ask that Mark Griffin is kept up to date if he hasn't met with um, any, any of the, the, the Scottish canals recently. I'll make sure that we facilitate uh, that uh, meeting as well. It's worth saying that the vast overwhelming majority of users of the canal still use it by foot and indeed uh, by cycling and on active travel, and, and that will continue to be uh, the case. But uh, notwithstanding that, I'll make sure Mark Griffin is kept up to date. We're getting a bit laborious in the questions and answers here. We're only at question three, which is Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessments it has conducted of passenger air links to Scotland's island communities. Hamza Youssef. Following a discussion at the uh, Islands Transport Forum, I assigned uh, Hayal uh, the task of looking at what air services in the Highlands and Islands could and should look like in the future. Uh, Hayal will be carrying out a consultation shortly, seeking views on what their strategy should look like over the coming period. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. I thought that might annoy you. I think the, uh, thank the Minister for that answer and the general surprise from uh, certain benches to the side of me. Um, given the level of dependence on a single operator in the island air routes and the effect that has on competition, can the Minister say whether he has any discussions with any other potential providers of services on these routes and whether he agrees in principle that competition would have the benefit on the level of service provided? Hamza Youssef. It's inter interesting. I mean, the member will know that Flybe, of course, uh, entered that market and the direct competition. Uh, to uh, Logan Air, and actually the market share of people using air services uh, increased. Uh, but, uh, you know, that uh, no doubt came at an impact uh, to Logan Air and, of course, to Fly B, who eventually ended up pulling out. From a Scottish Government's perspective, uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, the more air services, the more connections to our islands, uh, I think, the better. So, therefore, if there is an approach, uh, certainly if it comes through Jamie Halcrow Johnson, if it comes to me direct, uh, I will continue to, to, to be open-minded about that. The main thing is the sustainability of air services and connectivity to islands is first and, and foremost in my mind. A uh, quick supplementary, please, from Liam MacArthur. Can I welcome the Minister's confirmation of the revelation that Hyle are going to engage in a prior consultation. In relation to internal uh, air services within Orkney, you may be aware of uh, capacity issues there and what are lifelines to those small island communities. Will you commit to engage with Orkney Islands Council about how this might be addressed as part of the overall uh, discussion around lifeline airline and uh, ferry uh, connections between the small isles within Orkney? I'm so used to that. I don't know if this is the opening salvo of another budget discussion and round of negotiations from uh, uh, those. I don't know if they were formerly Lib Dems, still are part of the group uh, that, that voted uh, uh, in the budget to support uh, the, SMP, uh, the Scottish Government's uh, budget in terms of internal, uh, uh, internal ferries. What I will do is, of course, uh, take up that discussion in my, my next conversation uh, with uh, Orkney Island Council. It's worth saying on this point on consultation, of course, uh, although he, he laughed, of course, and scoffed, that uh, Hyal did announce just yesterday, I think it was, possibly the day before, that they will be extending their exemptions based on the consultation and the passenger surveys they've had. And that includes, of course, those that are travelling 
uh, into, uh, well, from, from, from other islands uh, and that may well uh, be affected by these car parking charges. Uh, an even quicker supplementary, please, from Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Last year, the number of passengers using Hyal airports was up 15.4%. Does the Minister agree that we should be doing all we can to ensure that businesses, residents and tourists can continue to benefit from these lifeline services to the highlands and islands? Hamza Yusuf. Yes, and, and the emphasis is not lost there, and Gail, Gail Ross is, is right to emphasise that, of course, uh, the, the importance of our uh, highland and island uh, airports. And that is why, for example, sustainability of air services is so, so vital and so important. The car parking charges are being brought in to ensure that uh, air services are sustainable for the future, whether it's for our island communities or indeed uh, our highland communities. Question number four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment that's made of the impact on farming of Brexit. Ferguson. Numerous studies confirm the Scottish Government's position that Brexit is a major threat to farming in Scotland. Those include the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute, funded jointly by the UK Government and devolved administrations, SRUC, Quality Meat Scotland and the AHDB. All of these show that failure to replicate the current trade arrangements with the EU means that Brexit will have a detrimental impact on farmers and sheep farmers in particular, and farm incomes could be seriously affected due to Scotland's ability to export being reduced and the possibility of a reduced budget from UK government for farm support. And in addition, businesses, presiding officer, are already reporting problems with workforce availability. Colin Beattie. Can the Cabinet Secretary update Parliament as to what progress has been made on the review of converg convergence funding promised by the UK Rural Secretary, Michael Gove, last year. Fergus Ewing. Well, sadly, although Mr Gove did promise that there would be a review, um, a promise originally made, incidentally, by Owen Kelly, um, I think in 2013-14, but broken by successive ministers until then, uh, Patterson, uh, in that period, but made by the UK government about five years ago, uh, Eventually, Mr. Gove decided that they would get around to implementing the pledge last November, and they promised to have it. And indeed, a Tory MP claimed credit for it. <laughs> uh, but since then, Mr. Gove has said that matters rest with the Treasury. So I think, presiding officer, that uh, Mr. Gove, as I've explained to him when I met uh, with Ms. Cunningham, uh, Mr. Gove, myself, a few weeks ago, I explained that this is a very serious matter indeed. This is money that the EU intended to go to Scottish farmers and Scottish farmers alone because only Scottish farmers qualified for the particular convergence funding and therefore my recommendation to Mr Gove is that he implement his promise without further delay that he persuade the Chancellor Mr Hammond to bring this up to the top of his entry and that we get on with this review which was promised so so many years ago and has still not been implemented by the UK government. Supplementary Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I, I very much share the Cabinet Secretary's frustration over the lack of progress in the review, but does he agree that one of the frustrations of Scotland's farmers is what they perceive as a lack of detail from the Scottish Government on their vision for the future of agricultural support post-Brexit? Organisations like the NFU and Scottish Environment Link are leading the way, exploring alternatives to CAP and setting out clear principles behind what that support should look like. So can the Cabinet Secretary say when he'll do the same and set out clearly the Scottish Government's vision and views on what post-Brexit support should look like in Scotland? Well, I don't accept that, uh, and the reasons I don't accept that are twofold. First of all, we have repeatedly sought at meetings with Mr Gove and Mr Eustace clarity about what precisely the powers of the Parliament will be. Uh, we have no absolute clarity over that. And secondly, about funding post-Brexit, and we absolutely know nothing, nothing about that. Can any member tell me any business plan, and I've been in business, which has no figures in it? It's ludicrous to suggest that anybody could come up with a detailed plan as long as the UK government completely fail to obtemper the promises that they made during the Brexit referendum when they said the funding would be at least matched. No wonder people voted for Brexit when they were told they were going to get the possibility of more money. And now we know nothing whatsoever. And the second reason why I disagree with Mr Smith is that uh, we uh, expect a report from the agricultural champions uh, on the uh, future of agriculture. 
and very shortly a consultation document from the National Council of Rural Advisors with their final report in September. And that report, incidentally, is a report which was, prepared, which, uh, was, was uh, uh, commissioned from this council that was set up directly in response to Parliament's wishes. So we are doing exactly as this Parliament has requested. Can I have a quick supplementary question and a quick answer, please? John Scott. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. And notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's answer to Mr Smith, can he tell Parliament today when the Scottish Government will outline their plans for future support for agriculture and what his priorities might be in that regard, declaring an interest? Because you didn't answer the Thank last question, sir. Well, uh, you know, as, as soon as the, the UK Government says what the funding will be, then it's possible to produce a plan. Um, I don't know if... I don't know, I used to run a business uh, and you had figures of estimated income and expenditure. There's no figures at all post-Brexit from the UK government, not one. And yet you guys, you guys and your party uh, promised that the people chair, would be please, better Mr. off. Ewing. Those guys <laughs> over there, presiding officer. Uh, uh, we shall shortly the see the publication of the agricultural champions proposals. There are four independent experts I think that the, instead of the opposition carping and making political points, they would be well advised to study carefully the recommendations from our agricultural champions, uh, which we expect to be published shortly. Question number five, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to the food and drink industry in the south of Scotland. Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presenting also direct investment and support to the food and drink sector in Scotland from the public sector equates to approximately £100 million per annum across a range of areas, including skills, education, research, industry development standards and capital investment. This funding is provided on a national basis and is available to companies throughout the south of Scotland region. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many of the food and drink companies in South Scotland are micro-businesses and need a local approach. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain when Connect Local will hold a workshop in Dumfries and Galloway and what monitoring will be put in place to ensure geographical parity of awards from the new regional food fund? Fergus Ewing. Uh, yes, the Member is correct to point to Connect Local and the work that they do. They Funding of £3 million from the Scottish Government and enables them to provide in the four-year period to 2020 an advisory uh, service. Uh, and my understanding is that it is expected that there will be a local event in response to a question of Collect Local. Uh, and I can write to her regarding the details and the timescale of that. I'll just, uh, just conclude by saying that Dumfries and Galloway uh, has outstanding uh, reputation and excellence in the production of high quality food and drink uh, and uh, I work closely with the South of Scotland, uh, new South of Scotland vehicle led by Professor Russell Griggs and Rob Dixon uh, and I think there's enormous opportunities for these businesses to be even more successful. Supplementary from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With Young's expected to announce bad news at Pinney's later today, can the Cabinet Secretary set out for me what support will be available to the workforce and will he reaffirm that the Scottish Government remains 100% committed to ensuring a new operator continues production on that site? Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, as the member knows, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse is leading uh, on this matter uh, and it's an extremely important to us that we get the best possible outcome. Uh, and I have been involved in meetings and discussions uh, there and end. Um, we are absolutely determined to get the best possible outcome. As Mr Mundell knows, that remains unchanged and will continue to be the case. Question number six was not lodged. Question number seven, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the rollout of fibre broadband, including ensuring that all new built homes have access. Fergus Ewing. Uh, the Digital Scotland Superfast broadband rollout has passed its 95% fibre coverage target and the independent commentator Think Broadband reports superfast coverage of 30 megs and above uh, now stands at 93.4% in Scotland. New investment gain share funding will increase these figures even further through 2018. Beyond that, we're investing £600 million in the initial phase of R100 
uh, which will extend super fast access to every home and business in Scotland. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and, and I welcome this, particularly the benefit families and businesses in Paisley will have. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what funding has been provided by the UK Government to support the rollout of super fast broadband to all premises in Scotland, including those in Paisley, as it is, after all, a policy responsibility which is entirely reserved? Fergus uh, well, well, yes, the, the UK Government did contribute £100 million of the over 400 million investment for the DSSB programme, and I acknowledge that less than the uh, Scottish public sector contribution, but nonetheless a, a, a reasonable size of contribution. But in respect of R100, uh, the funding is 600 million pounds for the whole of Scotland. It's the biggest funding of any single broadband project ever, ever in the UK. And I'm very sad to say that the UK government is contributing of that 21 million. Sure. We are contributing 579 million, and the UK government are putting in 21 million, 3%. I, I think that's a disgrace. And what I don't understand is why, when the Scottish Tories say they're standing up for Scotland, not one of them has criticised this pathetic contribution of 21 million. Not one of them here or in Westminster has had the guts to say this is the reserve function and we should be making our fair contribution. I think that is truly sad and pathetic, but we are seeking to obtain a proper commensurate co contribution from the UK government, and obviously we will not let this matter rest. That concludes questions on the rural economy and connectivity, and we will now move on to portfolio questions on environment, climate change and land reform. I'll give just a moment or so for people to get in their places. We come to question number one, Anna Sauer. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will meet its carbon emission targets and lower air pollution in Glasgow. Hamza Youssef. Our climate change plan sets out the actions needed to continue to drive down Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, many of these will have uh, additional positive impacts, such as improvements in local air quality. Uh, for example, the plan includes the introduction of low emission zones to Scotland's four largest cities, the first of which, of course, will be Glasgow by the end of this year. The Scottish Government is also working closely with Glasgow City Council as it implements its measures contained in the Council's Air Quality Action Plan. It's providing practical and also financial assistance to both monitor air quality and support the delivery of measures. On top of that, of course, we're looking to see how we can uh, move more freight from road to rail, uh, increase electric vehicle uptake, and indeed, of course, continue to invest in our public transport in Glasgow and wider Scotland to help to reduce uh, our carbon emissions. Anna Sarwar. Thank the Minister for that answer. We all agree that carbon emissions need to fall. There are clear health benefits as well as climate change considerations. Before London introduced the congestion charge, huge investment was made to deliver improved public transport and active transport and active travel opportunities. Can the Minister outline what additional transformative investment will be made in public transport and active travel opportunities in Glasgow before any charging is introduced? Hamza Youssef. It's not a charging scheme uh, as such, although I should say uh, it was uh, Labour councillor Matt Kerr that uh, brought forward an amendment to the recent uh, uh, city administration's proposals which would introduce congestion charging so I'd be wary uh, of that and we'll have conversations uh, in and around uh, that of course. Uh, what I would say is he's absolutely right, uh, investment in public transport is absolutely vital to go hand in hand, it's not an either or uh, I think uh, here. So we'll continue to invest in Egypt of course which will see faster journey times between Glasgow and Edinburgh. We'll continue to invest in new rolling stock which will of course attract more people to our railways. In terms of uh, other investment, we've, uh, if he's in the south side of Glasgow and Victoria Road he'll see uh, the South City Way uh, that we are investing in for better active travel between the south of the city and indeed into the city centre and many other projects that are active travel as well. But I would like to just emphasise not either or. I think you have to invest uh, in, uh, of course, the low emission zone, which is pioneering in Scotland, uh, and then also invest in a public transport network as well. Supplementary, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If we're going to achieve the, the targets that the Minister has spoken about, then surely when there is money to spend on investing in the built environment, it needs to be directly achieving a reduction in the volume of polluting transport and making it safer and easier 
to use active travel, uh, like the standard of, of bike lanes that the minister just praised on Victoria Road in the south side. So would it not be a missed opportunity if Glasgow City Council continue with their plans for Byers Road, one of the most polluted parts of the city, without including uh, both mitigating measures to reduce through traffic and proper, safe, physically separated cycle space so that people can cycle on that uh, busy road without being in danger constantly from the volume of traffic there. Hamza Youssef. I say when it comes to uh, particular schemes, there is, of course, the local authority's decision to take those ones forward. I'm sure, again, he can engage directly with Glasgow City Council. I think he'll agree with me, though, that the leadership being shown by Anna Richardson, Councillor Anna Richardson from City Council, uh, and indeed officials like George Gillespie and indeed others, uh, there is a real step change and a cultural shift uh, from Glasgow City Council recently with the new administration into more active travel. We can see that uh, with their projects that they've committed to in both Community Links and Community Links Plus. But on the Byers Road scheme, uh, he would be best, of course, to take that up directly uh, with Glasgow City Council. Question number two, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to farmers to prevent riverbank erosion. Rosanna Cunningham. The Rural Payments Agri Environment and Climate Change Scheme contains a number of funding measures aimed at the restoration and protection of riverbanks. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the Minister for that answer. There are a number of uh, constituents across my Dumfrieshire constituency who are struggling to access funds that are urgently needed following severe weather over the winter. There are banks that have broken and huge quantities of land uh, are disappearing. Uh, is there anything that she can do to look into that and accelerate payments to those who need it most? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, the, uh, we are aware that there are some customers experiencing difficulties at the moment in submitting applications uh, for uh, various IX options. And we've identified the applications that are currently in draft. I don't know if those are the ones that he's discussing uh, today. Um, and uh, and will, uh, for those cases, particularly allow the submission uh, of late applications after the 31st of May. Um, we understand this is likely to affect around 20 applicants. And I would be happy for the member uh, to uh, bring to me the, the names uh, of individual constituents to see if, I, if this marries up with the information that I'm being told. Uh, and we'll see if we can help put things uh, onto a better keel. Supplementary from Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, as well as erosion, pollution is also a major issue for our rivers. In Muirdeen, runoff from a farmer spreading industrial waste has created an environmental incident with polluted water and an extreme noxious smell for the residents of Dunfermline, a smell so bad that it was making people physically sick. What assurances can the government give me that its agencies have the powers to stop people when they deliberately damage the environment around them by dumping or spreading pollutants? Uh, broadly related, but if the Cabinet Secretary is content to um, As it to happens, answer. Presiding Officer, uh, the member was raising uh, some related uh, issues at uh, the committee he's a member of on Tuesday morning, so I am conscious of his concerns uh, uh, around uh, the, the way some issues are being handled, uh, and if he cares to write uh, with detail uh, about the incident to which he's referring, I will be only happy to investigate. Question number three, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to bring forward a clean air bill. Rosanna Cunningham. We are continuing to make good progress in delivering the actions set out in our Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy, including the establishment of Scotland's first low emission zone in Glasgow by the end of this year and in Aberdeen, Dundee and Edinburgh by 2020. We have committed to a full review of Cleaner Air for Scotland by 2020, any requirements for further policy or legislative changes will be considered as part of that process. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It's been a quarter of a century since the Clean Air Act was passed. Is it not time for a new Clean Air Act that adopts the World Health Organization principles on air quality guidelines? For example, research from the British Heart Foundation at the University of Edinburgh has shown that diesel exhaust produce tiny nanoparticles which can injure blood vessels and contribute to cardiovascular disease. Will the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the activity the Scottish Government has undertaken to reduce air pollution and minimise exposure to harmful diesel fumes? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I think I've just indicated that we are, in fact, undertaking a review 
uh, um, uh, of our Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy, which was only published in November 2015. So I think a review uh, as quickly as that indicates the, the uh, urgency with which we understand uh, this is being taken. Uh, once that review uh, has been undertaken, we will look very carefully at that. If there are legislative changes required as part of that, then uh, we will uh, think very carefully about that. But can I just say that Scotland is leading the way uh, on delivering cleaner air, and we've already adopted several of the proposals that are in DEFRA's current draft strategy. So I, I don't think uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, allow an impression to develop that somehow uh, we are lagging behind. In 2016, we were in fact the first country in Europe to adopt the World Health Organization's guideline value for fine particulate matter. And I think that is something that the UK government is only beginning to look at. A short supplementary, please, from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that, according to Cancer UK, cigarette smoking was responsible for 5,736 people being diagnosed with cancer, compared to 288 cases due to other forms of air pollution, will new clean air policy include action to further reduce cigarette smoking and its deadly impact on Scotland's health? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, legislation on smoking in enclosed public spaces is already in force. The Parliament's further legislated for smoking in cars. The Government has also legislated to bring in no smoking areas around hospital buildings and many local authorities already have restrictions on smoking around play areas for children in parks. Our forthcoming tobacco action plan also includes proposals for restricting smoking in other places such as in communal stairwells. We have no proposals to include smoking uh, at the moment in any clean air legislation which might emerge from the review I have just mentioned in my earlier answer. And question number four is from Kenny Gibson. Sorry, <laughs> Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> Kenneth, indeed. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the environmental impact is of using wholly recycled retread lorry tyres compared with new ones. Rosanna Cunningham. The reuse of tyres which are retreaded to the required British standards of quality and safety clearly has a positive environmental impact by extending the life of the original product, decreasing the amount of used tyres being sent for disposal and reducing the amount of new tyres required for the market. This fits in with our circular economy strategy, making things last, which encourages materials to be kept in high value use for as long as possible and thereby minimising the need for the use of virgin material. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Every wholly recycled retread lorry tyre saves 85 litres of oil. Such tyres also last up to 150% longer, which is no doubt why at least 15, 15 Scottish local authorities use them. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary encourage other local authorities, the wider public sector and indeed the private sector to do likewise, given that tyres are not only more friendly to the environment, but retreaded in Scotland, sustaining Scottish jobs, whereas new tyres are wholly important? Rosanna Cunningham. Indeed, the benefits are considerable. The Scottish Government supports all forms of reuse and remanufacture, particularly when Scottish business and economy is benefiting. Scottish waste legislation is underpinned by the waste hierarchy, and the high quality reuse of materials is key to its application. While the important thing is that all retreads reach the required standards, I would certainly encourage all stakeholders who use tyres to consider their merits and more generally, how a more circular approach can be good for the environment and for business. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Should be William Kidd. To ask the Scottish <laughs> Government... <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide a further update on progress in developing the low emission zone in Glasgow. Rosanna Cunningham. Nope, that should be coming. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, the look of shock on the Cabinet Secretary's <laughs> face there. How was that, Yusuf? <laughs> no, I can see how we can get us uh, confused. Uh, Glasgow City Council <laughs> published an update report on the 20th of March in relation to progress uh, with developing the Glasgow Low Emission Zone, with a further update expected to be published in June. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Minister for that reply. Emissions and fumes from traffic affect everyone and need to be tackled, obviously. But of course, those on lower incomes are not only most affected by pollution, but also by any potential fare increases. Can the Minister say how grants to bus companies for retrofitting can help avoid fare rises? Hamza Yusuf. Uh, well, he's absolutely right that we are, uh, of course, committed to helping to fund uh, retrofit or indeed emission abatement. Uh, measures uh, for bus operators. We are, of course, also funding uh, or giving some funding towards, uh, substantial funding towards the low emission zones uh, across the four cities. Uh, I would see no reason, therefore, uh, to use the low emission zone as any excuse to, to, to raise fares 
uh, at all. And of course, uh, the last time the welfare arises in Glasgow, I took that issue up uh, directly uh, with uh, First Glasgow. So there's no reason why um, the implementation of low emission zone, which has a lead in time, is phased over a number of years, uh, should give uh, way to, to fair rises. The supplementary from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware of the Friends of the Earth reports that have warned of um, the significant possibility of ozone events across Scotland this week. With that in mind, what arrangements does his government have in place to protect vulnerable people with pre-existing lung conditions from illness brought about by the low air quality and ozone events such as this if they occur in Scotland? Thank you. Hamza Yousaf. Forgive me, I'll have a look at the Friends of the Earth uh, report that she refers to, but the government is taking uh, a range of measures, which of course the Cabinet Secretary uh, has outlined, and I think the most ambitious uh, plans uh, that we have here for the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, transport has to play a really key part in that. In fact, we are, transport is, uh, and this is not a good thing at all, of course, is the largest emitter uh, of uh, emissions at the moment. So, you know, transport has to be a key part of that. Low emission zones, active travel, uptake of electric vehicles, uh, and of course we have uh, ambitious targets and all of those uh, plus more but clearly there's a cross-government uh, responsibility here and I intend as Transport Minister to certainly play my part in that. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its environmental policy and its climate change commitments are informed by active travel. <laughs> Hamza Yousaf. Well, just, just as in my, my previous answer, that active travel and building an active nation is very much at the heart of this administration's thinking uh, when it comes to, to, to our climate change uh, plans and, and decommitments. That's why we double an active travel budget, as you know, from 40 million mm. to 80 million. This funding is providing cycling and walking infrastructure across the country, segregated infrastructure, for example, in towns and cities, uh, greater access to bikes, I hope, including electric bikes uh, as well, education and training programmes for adults and children learning to cycle, and making our towns and cities generally safer, friendlier, but also greener places to live and to work. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the, the Minister for that answer and, and welcome the, the projects that he's doing. But can I point out there are some projects where I think uh, there has been missed opportunities. For example, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, there is a lack of uh, cycle racks, for example, bike racks. There's some major inf um, infrastructure projects being designed without uh, uh, cycle routes and, and capacity on rail carriages for bikes is, is also being reduced. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can impress upon his colleagues and other portfolios that active, uh, active travel considerations uh, need to be paramount if environmental targets are going to be met. Hamza Yousaf. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think the, the point, generally speaking, is a fair one. And what I would say is when it comes to uh, projects uh, on the ground in various local authority areas. We have more than doubled the Community Links project. That is the project uh, that, of course, helps to build some of those uh, infrastructure projects that he refers to. So from 15 million to 36 million uh, pounds. Uh, in the, the first round of that will be announced shortly, but there will be some, some uh, money uh, for round two and subsequent rounds. So I would encourage him to speak to partners where he thinks they can make benefit uh, of that very uh, important funding. Uh, in terms of cross-government working, uh, there is really uh, a very good and collaborative cross-government working on this agenda. For example, I meet on a regular occasion with the, the Public Health Minister, with Aileen Campbell, to talk about, for example, our commitment around an active nation commissioner as well. So there's good cross-government uh, working. And the very last point I'd make, just gently, of course, is though he welcomes that doubling of the budget from 40 to 80 million, it would have been nice to have the Conservative support for that budget, yeah. of course, and that increase in that budget. Short supplementary from Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I thank the Minister certainly for his uh, comments a few moments ago. But uh, what uh, further actions actually can the Scottish Government undertake to actually encourage people to change their behaviour? And uh, can this, under, can this uh, particular piece of work take place with some type of uh, campaign or further work with local authorities? Hamza Yousaf. I think they can. I think behavioural change is, is, is hugely uh, important. So uh, one is if you look at our, our younger uh, generation, I know uh, Mike Rumbles has a particular interest in this too, that we offer as many young people the opportunity to get cycle training, both uh, in their school, but also hopefully uh, on the road practical uh, training uh, as well, which is hugely important. There's then, of course, looking at those uh, that perhaps haven't had the confidence to cycle previously, uh, that might have had some sort of mobility issues, even disabilities, uh, or indeed uh, other chronic health conditions. I think that's where perhaps the exciting opportunity uh, around e-bikes uh, might well present themselves. And I'm looking very hard at how we can use some of that doubled active travel budget to, to not only affect behaviour change, which is important, but also make cycling and active travel uh, more accessible 
for more people and as many people as possible. We were a little late starting this section of portfolio questions. So question number eight, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce plastic pollution in the Firth of Forth. Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, Presiding officer, you would uh, probably disapprove of me uh, embarking on a very long list of the things that the government is doing. Uh, but within our marine litter strategy, many policies are already underway to target the particular issues faced in the Firth of Forth, namely sewage related debris and pre production plastic pellets, also known as nurdles. Scottish Water is currently investigating the problem of litter entering the estuary area through sewage systems. They'll report this summer and will identify solutions. Uh, obviously, two of the plastics are being dealt with, microbeads and plastic stem cotton buds. And with regard to nurdles, uh, we do support the plastic industry's Operation Clean Sweep scheme, which encourages responsible handling of pre-production plastics. However, more does need to be done. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? Surveys over the years across the Firth for Forth have found anything between 200,000 to more than 2 million plastic nurdles. People have been keen to clean up in Malovian beaches, and last autumn, 450,000 nurdles were removed from the shore but close to Bowness by volunteers. Can I ask the Scottish Government if it would consider localised plans for the worst plastic pollution hotspots? Rosanna uh, I would, in fact, consider anything that I thought would actually uh, help this difficulty. Nurdles are a major problem. I've been following some of the uh, local activity on uh, social media, uh, and I think it is uh, one of those things, however, that needs to be dealt with uh, across uh, countries. It is a, it is a global uh, problem. Nurdles are an absolutely essential part of the production of plastics, uh, and the difficulty is managing them at source because we cannot produce plastic items without them. One way we can help, of course, is to reduce that reliance on plastic in the first place. And the last um, supplementary to the session to Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, Sunnyside Ocean Defenders are doing amazing and inspiring work across Scotland. They're based in Glasgow Province, a constituency that is not noted for having a coastline. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this valuable activity is tangible proof that this is an issue that affects everyone, not just those with a shoreline? Rosanna Cunningham. I think it's fair to say the children of Sunnyside Primary have worked tremendously hard to highlight the problem of single-use plastics. They have supported us introducing our deposit return uh, scheme with the Have You Got the Bottle campaign, and they're now promoting the message of Nestro at all. And despite being landlocked, uh, they are working very hard uh, with uh, a marine conservation society doing uh, a variety of beach litter surveys at Prestwick uh, um, South and involving themselves in cleans at Air and Arica, which of course uh, Jackie Bailey might be interested in. They clearly show that this issue concerns us all regardless of age, whether on the coast or inland, and I applaud all their efforts and the efforts of children the length and breadth of Scotland concerned about yeah. the impact of plastic on both land and sea. That concludes uh, portfolio questions and we'll now move on to the next item of business.